40% of all the people who live on Earth live within 60 miles of a coastline. Never before have we been more dependent on our marine resources than we are today. But what about the future? How do we manage our water world into our next century? Well, I'm a, I'm a marine biologist. I have a, an embarrassingly good job. I can study anything that I want to. Uh, I can uh, focus on things that help people, and I've tried to do that as much as I can. But in the 40 years I've been working in Maine, I've seen underwater revolutions that are shocking. And without equally revolutionary new ways of managing our resources, we will not have them to sustain our people and our maritime heritage. Now, if I took you all right out here uh, for a scuba dive, first of all, you'd all be real cold. But second, what you'd probably see are a lot of lobsters, good number of crabs, uh, you might see some sea urchins, some, some kelp, but you really won't see much in the way of any big fish at all. And I thought that's what I've seen for the last 40 years, and that's the way it's always been. Well, I actually had a really remarkable experience uh, in the 1980s going to a place 80 miles offshore, Cassius Ledge. And on Cassius Ledge, I was able to go in a small four-person submarine, and from that submarine, I saw a world that was unlike anything that I had been seeing, one that was dominated by big fish, codfish, pollock, wolffish, no lobsters or crabs. It was really very different, and, and it got me thinking. You know, this isn't so much uh, a submarine as it may be a time machine that I'm in. That this is really a view of the lost world of the Gulf of Maine. And that, if that's true, then where should we find some evidence for this? And as it happens that there's some great archaeological sites along the coast of Maine. Places that have been studied and they go through layer after layer and they piece together how people made their living on the coast. And what we learn is that the first people that came to the coast of Maine ate seafood. And you can find the bones of codfish and not just abundant cod, but when you work out from their vertebral diameters, uh, their size, they're averaging a meter in length and they're catching them from canoes. For 4,000 years, they were doing that. And really, into historical periods, we know these big predators were still on our coast. So things fundamentally had changed. And I got very interested as an ecologist, you know, how have they changed? So I took the opportunity to go out there where we were working with submarines and place uh, lobsters that we tether onto little patio blocks. We have video cameras going. There's all kinds of fish around. This is in a kelp forest out of Cassius Ledge. And, and what we found was 75% of all the lobsters that we tethered out there were, were consumed within 24 hours. And as a matter of fact, we lost five of those patio blocks. <laughs> so it's a really, really different world. Uh, and looking out and working there for a good part of a decade, we never saw lobsters or crabs. And I started to think, that this is a, a really interesting revolution that's gone on on our coastline, but it's underwater and it's out of sight. And the reason why this has happened and it happens all over the world is you go from the first canoes that ply the oceans of the Gulf of Maine to the sailing vessels, to the steam vessels, to diesel, to improved ways of fishing from hook and line to purse seines. We have Refrigeration, which is a remarkable way to get product of food. We go from local markets to regional markets to national markets to global markets, and we're seeing huge impacts all over our planet. And this is uh, really well illustrated if you just look at the story of cod on our coast. The National Marine Fisheries Service uh, keeps track of the number of cod by doing annual tows, and, and they figure all out how many cod do we have. Well. If you look at this from the 1970s, about that decade, we had a kind of a donut around the, the, from the George's Bank along the coast of Maine, a uh, pretty good abundance of cod. By the time we got to the 1980s, we see that donut breaking up. We go to the 1990s, it's breaking up even more. Go to the 2000s, and what we're looking at now is really a predator-free coastal Maine, functionally a domesticated ecosystem. What do you do when you domesticate 
any system, you take the predators away. We might add bait. We might get into that later. But what has happened is this dominant predator, the whole North Atlantic was dominated by big predatory fish, and we took them out. We ate them. And uh, what's left are the things that were prey, lobsters, crabs, and sea urchins, all exploded in abundance. And so part of what we end up seeing when we do this, in fact, is um, looking at the lobster landings. Going back to 1960, you could go back further than that. We have a remarkable increase in landings and value. In Maine, 80 to 90 percent of our marine resource value comes from this single species. Now, how many of you would like to put all of your life savings in a single stock? You probably won't. People don't advise you to do that. We are in a very risky place. And, um, and you could ask the question, well, you know, well, what could go wrong? Well, you have to realize that this, this pattern, which frankly, there is not another fishery I know of on, the, on planet Earth that's been targeted for over a century and is doing better today than ever before. This is amazing. The absence of predators is certainly part of it. And the conservation ethic within the lobstering community is a huge part of it too. But also, if you go further to the north, it's too cold for lobsters. And if you go to the south, it's too warm. Maine happens to be on the sweet spot, climate sweet spot for lobsters. But it's shifting to the north. And as this happens, we have water temperatures to the south that are actually too warm for lobsters. And they start getting stressed. There's things like heat shock proteins that they have to produce. Well, they're metabolically expensive. And so where does that extra energy come from? They compromise their immune system. And as a matter of fact, in Rhode Island uh, in 1998, which was the warmest year on the planet, a shell disease broke out. It had been around for a long time, but suddenly it became epizootic. 80% of the lobsters died. That was 1998. They have never come back. These are surprises. Uh, you know, so many of these changes, you might assume certain things are going to happen with warming climates, but this is a big surprise. And um, th these surprises are very difficult for managing. So what we're talking about here are two big things going on. We have fishing pressure, which is allowing some of these things that were formerly prey to explode in abundance. Uh, and then we have warming seas. So here in the Gulf of Maine, um, as it gets warmer, things like black sea bass and red hake are showing up suddenly. They used to be living to the south, and they're moving into our area. Again, a new surprise. In 2012, we had what's known as the ocean heat wave. Lobsters shed in April. It was really crazy. Um, but squid started coming in in some of the areas. And the fishing community immediately knew how to deal with these squid. Well, they saw them. They saw them locally. And they marketed those. And this got me thinking. You know, I think we're, we may have to reinvent how we manage fish stocks. We're doing it at the wrong scale. These surprises can be dealt with locally. If you have a tree fall down in your backyard, you know, you're going to get out a chainsaw, or you're going to know some bloke that has a chainsaw, and you're going to fix it, right? You're not going to wait for some county commissioner to say, oh, you know, <laughs> the tree fell in your backyard. Uh, unlikely to happen. And so um, I think that we should be thinking about how we manage these stocks much more locally and with the cooperation and collaboration with the fishing community. Um, Sea urchins is one that has had a remarkable history on the coast of Maine. Um, it exploded in abundance, uh, and suddenly a market in Japan made this very valuable on the coast of Maine. And uh, I had always seen the world was dominated by these sea urchins. But in 1987, the fishery began. In 1993, it was the peak year. I took this footage at Pemaquid Point in 1993. Those little circles are sea urchins. And I thought, this is the way it's always going to be. Unbelievable uh, that this local area at Pemaquid Point, uh, I was diving from exactly the same location, two years later, looks like this. It's a kelp forest. Can you imagine that kind of change? This shows us a couple of things. One is, we're talking about a remarkably productive ecosystem, one that's highly dynamic, capable of these kind of booms. But also, can you imagine a grassy field in Maine that suddenly, in two years, just develops a, a forest, a fully grown forest. Those kind of things are surprising. They're shocking. 
And even though we all sort of like surprises, you know, I mean, you, you get a present and it's all wrapped, and what's in it, it's cool. Um, fisheries managers, they don't like surprises. And uh, they assume that if an area is overfished, if we just stop fishing, the fish are going to come back. Well, in fact, stopping fishing on George's Bank in the 1990s, the cod have not come back. Sea urchin uh, that went through and completely wiped out sea urchins in some places in the 1990s, they have not come back. And so we're looking at a world that is much more dynamic and much more surprising, and yet the local people do know what's going on. And, you know, if you're going to do a kind of a local ecosystem-based fisheries co-management, there's really not a better place to try that than Maine. Maine has had local fisheries management for ages. The lobster fishery is fundamentally a local fishery that the local community watches what each other is doing. They actually often don't trust the other guy. Um, and then they may think somebody's doing something that's wrong and they'll give them a warning. But the conservation ethic is very strong. The, number, the amount of illegal activity within the lobster fishery is, is very low. That is a really good model. Clam flats are actually done by each community. And now we are actually looking at every single bay that has scallops, figuring out a quota, and, and fishing each one of those bays separately based on what we know is in that bay. That's all great, but what isn't so great is that where we are today is we have fisheries licenses that are species specific. If you go for lobsters, you really can't fish for ground fish. And if you fish for ground fish, you can't go for lobsters and scallops, have their own license. Each one of those species is like a silo. And it's pretty obvious that we're dealing with an ecosystem that's highly interactive. So what I think we need to do is, uh, is at least three things. We have to work together with the fishing community and come up with ways within regions to assess all the species that exist in a place. Um, this is decentralizing our, our assessment. And then we have to have multi-species licenses so that we can work as a community. If black sea bass come in and they're juveniles, the community decides to leave them alone, they can harvest them profit profitably and sustainably next year or the year after. You can do that if you all have this kind of collective sense. And third, this is a crazy idea, and we're going to have to have an area where we can test this out and fine-tune it. But with those things, and with a lot of people sharing in this, I think that we may be able to deal with these kind of revolutionary changes that we're seeing. And if you think about it, you know, what can come from a revolution? Well, we've seen things come from revolutions. We've had 13 independent colonies that did things very independently, but somehow we were able to network. And that kind of networking that has to happen from fishing community to fishing community to the academics to the managers and on up could be done. And I'd say that do we have to do something this revolutionary to sustain our marine resources? I think so. Thank you.